so the aim of this today um, is to really address how um, COVID-19 has affected us in the many ways it has personally and professionally, but today to concentrate on spine surgery, how it's affected us, uh, our patients, our trainees, healthcare provision, the positives we can take from it, as well as the negatives, the future and the challenges. That does seem like quite a lot of things to cover in an hour, but uh, it is going to be a fairly open discussion because this is a very new situation we find ourselves in. We're going to have three short presentations from each of us, and you can uh, ask questions through the uh, Zoom uh, utility uh, uh, just by typing, and we will hopefully answer those for you as clearly and as uh, well as we can. Um, we're very keen to hear your views and ideas. Uh, it's an open-ended situation where no one really has any firm answers, and we have to learn from each other, so please uh, do chip in. Um, now, before we just go on to my talk, I just want you to make sure you're aware that uh, your video and audio as participants is disabled uh, and uh, you've joined the listen and view only mode as you can see and you can send a, a message by uh, clicking chat and you can leave the meeting at any time and annotate on a whiteboard. So if you'd like to um, uh, take away that slide now please, um, Diana, I will um, share my screen. Um, and go to my talk, I hope. Hopefully you can all now see my talk. Um, yeah, good. So um, I, I put this together a few days ago, but not a great deal has changed in the UK. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of the uh, general situation we find ourselves in the UK at the present time, uh, with a real epicentre in the busy urban conurbation of uh, London and the South East, and a few in other major cities, but you'll see where uh, I work, if I can see my mouse there, which is here in Bristol, even though it's one of the biggest cities in the UK, we've had rather little um, or no um, uh, COVID in relation to other places. Um, so we've had a, um, uh, so what we know from the uh, media nationally, which is the main source of information, as I'm sure you can assume, and, uh, rather than it coming from through healthcare sources, is we get daily death rates, we have daily COVID uh, cases diagnosed and our NHS which is our state healthcare system in the UK is very much being perceived as being heroic and controlling all this. The state healthcare system has completely taken over private healthcare for a minimum of three months so all private hospitals in the UK have been taken over by um, the national state healthcare system. <coughs> preparation for this has been a huge increase in the number of ICU beds available. Um, Mortuaries are being built in preparation. They're currently all empty. Um, and these massive Florence Nightingale hospitals are being built. Um, uh, they're so-called Nightingale hospitals. They're big, huge hospitals are built to host ventilated patients. The one in London has uh, 4,000 uh, patients. So this is the lockdown we have. It's different to other countries. We're allowed to go out and exercise uh, for a reasonable amount per day. Um, we're allowed to go to work for essential jobs. Uh, essential shops are open. Um, and it's generally exceedingly well observed. Um, and I think the latest figures from the government say about 80% of people are observing it and they're expecting it to be about 40%. We do not have an exit plan, which I know is something that has already started in Denmark, uh, I know, and Czech Republic and other countries. And countries such as Sweden obviously haven't really um, locked down like we have in Spain and France somewhat more. I would question though that, um, just my personal thoughts, that we obviously are gonna compare lots of things from different countries. We've got very different testing strategies in different countries. And in the UK, we're only really testing people in hospital and a, a select few healthcare workers that may have symptoms. So we're really not testing that much. And we don't have a reliable test, as we all know. We don't have a reliable antibody test. And population density is really important for me. So real numbers may not hide, may, may hide the, uh, the problem. I think it's important to take on board cultural differences that we all know even within Europe and certainly outside Europe compared to Europe and what treatment differences there are between different countries. And I'd be interested to hear what people can say. So these are new stories that are emerging in the UK uh, and things are swinging a little bit in terms of what we're hearing. So we had this big hospital open in London with 4,000 beds for ventilated patients. And we found out at the weekend, this may be a different number now, and probably is, 
but there were only 19 out of 4,000 beds were being used. And that even in London as a whole, there was intensive care capacity. So it wasn't the Armageddon situation that had been uh, uh, postulated over Easter. We know we've got high levels of uh, infection in care homes that are largely undiagnosed. And we know we've got high levels of positive non-hospital cases, or that's postulated because we haven't tested. Um, the ICU's potential use may well have been exaggerated. Um, and we're starting to see quite a bit in the media and the rumblings that we've been worried about for some time as clinicians about the harm it's causing patients not getting treatment for obvious things such as cancer, um, cardiac care, and then definitely surgical problems, including spine, which is what we want to focus on today. What I know locally, and this is very much my personal view, uh, and not that of the whole UK from what I've heard, is that it's very, very different in Bristol. Um, we've doubled our ICU beds and currently in my hospital where we normally have 48 beds available we've got nearly 100 beds and I think there's 15 patients in out of 100 beds. We've got about 250 empty beds in the major COVID centre here and uh, it is just extremely extremely quiet and we, we don't know why and nobody's really focusing on it. We're actually almost doing nothing and we've stopped all non-emergency care. So for spinal surgery, these are the guidelines we're adhering to, and these are national uh, guidelines. With respect to personal protective equipment, then we, we keep getting different guidelines, and this that are changing all the time. Uh, but in essence, um, we've been told that we have to wear uh, uh, full um, uh, personal protective equipment when in contact with a known COVID patient or when a patient is involving an aerosol uh, and for surgery. Uh, although that's slightly variable. Um, we're allowed to do injections, but only for nerve pain, not for back pain. And we've been told to reduce the dose of steroid, assess the risk on an individual basis. For surgery, the guidelines really are quite, um, well, they're quite, they're, they're quite um, take your breath away when you first read them. We're currently just in tier one. Um, and that is, we're allowed to treat patients who have urgent time dependent need for treatment such as spinal cord compression, fractures, um, acute radicular pain, cord requina syndrome. But they go through to the very severe case scenario where we have an Armageddon where everywhere's in meltdown, where it says patients who are higher risk and have got spinal cord compression, then we just have to leave them. So that's um, really quite dire, but we're nowhere near there yet. Um, we've been advised to use telecommunications, which is a big change for all of us and not examining patients. And we're doing virtual MDTs very much like we're doing this today using Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Personally, um, having been a very busy uh, consultant doing lots of clinical work and surgery, I've been asked to take on a different role. And three weeks ago, I had to learn how to read ECGs, um, do blood gases, read bloods and all sorts of things. And I've been put onto ward cover. Um, and I went there every day last week and was sent home because nothing was happening. Um, and I've been told I have to assist other surgeons as required, whether it's a brain tumour or something else. But I am doing spinal call, and so if there's an emergency that comes in, um, I'd have to deal with that. We've stopped all elective practice, including children, and we're just doing telecommunications. Um, so sometimes I feel like it's a great thing that I'm having a bit of time off to, you know, spend time with my family and uh, you know, have a lie-in and spend time in my pyjamas. But um, other times, I'm really worried about it, and uh, it's given me quite a lot of anxiety. One of my anxieties is about what's going to happen at the end of all this, um, and we just don't know. So I, some people say it's going to be really busy because we've got a big backlog. Others say there's going to be an increased disease burden with bigger, stiffer curves, for example, and worse outcomes and higher complications, maybe more chronic pain. Maybe it's going to be quieter because patients have realised they can cope with their conditions and don't need treatment. Maybe they want to avoid healthcare environments and hospital settings because of worries about COVID. And maybe there'll be no money to treat these patients. Um, but I think overall it should be better because I think what this has shown us is that how healthcare systems can respond if needed. I mean, the response in the UK, if you look at it, has been just stunning how much provision we've got if you've got COVID. It just seems to ignore everybody else. And I think maybe if we can target things more effectively, it will be good. And I think society has to change for the better in many ways. So they're my thoughts. Um, they're probably very different to some people, similar to others. I don't know. 
Um, I don't know if you've got any questions that have been raised from that, Martin or Sebastian, um, or that have come from the participants. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so far, we have uh, not have any questions. So maybe we just repeat that at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A. If you click the Q&A, you can type in your questions for Ian if you have any questions. And of course, for me and uh, Sebastian as well when we have done our talk. So just wait one half uh, minute. To Ian, see if Ian I, have a, I have a question for you. Uh, you said you're now in, in tier one. So this is I was I, I was guessing this is the first uh, scenario, and and what you mentioned of tier two and tier three are eventually those are eventual scenarios if things get worse. Yeah. Do you foresee things getting worse or getting better? Because from what I hear, at least in France and and the rest of Europe, mainly Italy and Spain, I don't have that much information about the UK. Things are getting better. It seems that we are getting over the uh, highest point of the epidemic and. Maybe if if we are lucky, you will you guys won't have to be in that tier two or tier three. No, I agree. I agree with that. I don't think we'll get to that point of. I, I generally don't think we'll get to that point of Armageddon. But my big worry is that because of the way things are, we'll just stay as we are, and that's the big risk that we stay as we are with issues regarding PPE, personal protective equipment, and not having the resource to actually carry out the work we want to do because we're still treating this low-grade number of patients with COVID that's affecting everything else. So it's, it's not going to go away. It's just going to be there. Um, I and mean, I think we need, we need to learn how we're going to work around that because we can't not carry on. So I don't think it's going to... I, I agree. I think we've, we... I, my feeling is we've hit a peak, but I, I can't see we're going to fall off that peak um, quickly. Okay. So uh, we have two questions now. The first question is... Uh, do you use any special equipment in order to reduce aerosol generating procedures? Yeah, well, in, in, so in the few procedures I've performed, I haven't used a burr. That's been, so I, I did a, an ACD two weeks ago um, uh, for the first time in my life without a burr. And I, I'm doing this thinking, you know, what's the, the risk here is I'm doing an operation I've never done before, or I've done lots of the operation before, but I've always used a, a burr or a drill. And now I'm doing it a different way. Is that more risk to the patient than just doing it normally or risk to me? And it's just a, you know, having to use a kerosene and a curette. So it's a very odd situation, but I did it without, the, without a burr. So it, that's the only thing I've done that's different. Okay. Um, we have one more there. question from Britt Rockos. He says, Mr. Harding, one of the issues here is the external resource nurses physiotherapists and probably trained nurses to support spine care. Where does the NHS and the spine unit see the solutions to this? Thanks, Brett. Not close. Brett, thank you. Hi, and uh, welcome from Toronto, wherever you are. Um, so uh, the, the issue at the moment is that we don't actually have many patients. So at the moment, we don't have hardly any work. So the, the resource for physios and OTs is, is, is not a problem. And in fact, they're all twiddling their thumbs. They've literally got nothing to do because all their elective practices are being stopped because they were told they had to go and manage respiratory COVID patients. So acutely, it's not a problem. Um, I, I think in, in the long run, um, it, they're in the same situation as us. They're going to need to find ways to um, adapt their practice and the use of PPE, which is going to be the big thing. Um, and it's only going to be better once we can test people and say they're definitely negative or they're definitely immune or they're vaccinated. That's the only thing we can do in the future that's going to change things radically. But I don't think they're in a radically different position to us. Ian, an interesting question from uh, Austin Levy. He's saying that uh, given how quiet things are right now, do you believe that the NHS or uh, the other national services should be dealing with COVID differently from an elective surgery perspective? I do, yeah. I really do, but again, it's uh, so I, I've, I've raised the questions though with my local healthcare providers and said, look, we should be doing, you know, maybe some paediatric deformity work. We should be doing, um, uh, you know, more than we are doing some slightly more urgent cases, you know, like you know people with ridiculous pain and things. And I've had a pushback from the managers in the hospital saying, well, we've got no PPE because it's out there in the media, 
that we, we're waiting to get PPE delivered from Turkey in the UK. Um, and it's been, PPE has been massively overused in the UK in the last two or three weeks, it, it, to the extent that, you know, even doing minor, minor procedures and, and doing an injection for somebody, you had to wear full PPE, even if they were not having a cough or not having a temperature. And so it's all been overused. And that is a massive, massive, massive factor. Um, so we have to limit the use of PPE, I think, and restrict it to those the people that really need it. Okay. Okay, should we, should we move on and go on to, uh, is, is Martin going to give us a, a presentation? Yeah. Yes, that'd be great, Martin. Yeah. So if no, I don't think there's any more questions. Sebastian, you don't have any comments further? No? No. Okay, I'll find my screen here. Uh, there you go. Uh, yep. uh, before Martin starts, Ian, one more question. Uh, I, I allowed to interrupt you, Martin, before, before oh. you start. One more question uh, asking if you're testing for COVID patients, if you're testing for COVID all the patients that you're operating. Uh, no. I'm guessing that the question includes the, the only patients that you're operating, which means the, the emergencies. No. You're not testing them? No. Okay. People are only getting tested for COVID if they've got a temperature or cough. They're not all getting tested if they're in hospital. I can say we do the same at my hospital. We only test patients who have symptoms. If they don't have symptoms of COVID, we don't test them. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm going to try to describe the situation in Denmark. So I, I put up this map because I saw Ian had a map. So I have the same map as uh, representative of Denmark. And as you see, the capital region is, of course, the most uh, severe hit region. And then we have a small part in, um, in uh, the main country where we also happen to have very high uh, numbers. So to start us, I just want to share this uh, next slide because I think it's very, very, very interesting because it also reflects some of the different uh, things we see in uh, European countries. So if you look, uh, this was uh, published by uh, the the European Union is state of health in the European Union in 2019 and you see the number of hospital beds per 100 habitants and in Germany it's 8.1 in France it's 6.1 but in Denmark it's only 2.6 and the same as the UK is only 2.1 so that makes a huge difference when you have to cope with a tsunami of patients coming into your hospital and of course, this uh, affects you, how you deal with it in the different countries, if you are aware of this. If you look at the number of uh, ICU beds per 100,000 uh, inhabitants, again, Germany is very high. They have almost 30 uh, beds for, for the patients, while UK only has 6.6. .6. And this issue is really important when you have this kind of situation we have now. In Denmark, we are pretty low too, but France, they have doubled the number of the Danish uh, in Denmark. And finally, this is not 2019, but 16. This is just uh, the length of stay for patients in hospital beds for when they get admitted to the hospital. France is very high, Germany is not as high, but UK and Denmark are, are low, and we are definitely the lowest uh, length of stay for any kind of surgery in, in or any kind of hospitalization in Denmark. <clears throat> I think these figures are very important to think about when you compare the countries in Europe. In Europe. Okay, so in Denmark, we started very early with closing down the country and almost everything was closed down, but you're still allowed to assemble outside in smaller groups. And later it became to only two two persons together, not more than two persons, but you can still do exercise outside, biking or whatever, and you're not stopped on the street to tell the police why you're on the street. You, can, you could still go out, just not assembling groups. And because of this, we had a very, very significant uh, change in the, in the death rate per day. As you see, this is from the very beginning of the lockdown in uh, early March. And then uh, the last figure here is from yesterday, where the number of deaths uh, is significantly lower than it was in the beginning of April. So this is just the death. And if you look at the number in hospital per day, per region in Denmark, 
and we have the capital region that's the yellow one the biggest one it's also show this curve they've been talking about all the time in the media that is kind of topping off now and it's flattening out and this is very good of course it's also very expensive for the society to do this and the last uh, one i'll show you so in my country we have when we started the lockdown, we have 1,060 ventilators. Uh, and this was uh, a number that uh, made big concerns because at that moment we saw what happened in Italy and Spain. So they wanted more ventilators. They closed the private hospitals. They were not allowed to, but they did it to make sure they could get hold on those ventilators at those areas as well. They were never used and we never had on a single day, more than 150 patients uh, in ventilators here in my country. And of course, this is um, just showing the result of the total lockdown of the country. And it's a good thing because that's what they wanted to obtain. And you can see here, uh, now we are down to, this is data from uh, today actually. We only have 72 patients in ventilators and 84 patients in intensive care unit. So it's going the right way here uh, in Denmark. So we have a controlled opening going on from last week where we, use, uh, where we started to uh, allow um, kids to go to institutions and uh, school kids up to fifth grade. There's been a lot of uh, noise in the media about this because suddenly uh, parents was afraid to send their kids to school, etc., etc. You can imagine how that is. And now, starting today, we even open up small businesses uh, in a controlled fashion. And this has all been after mathematical uh, calculation by the healthcare, uh, the Danish FDA and the, the Virology Institute. So we open small businesses like hairdressers, tattooers, masseurs, physiotherapists, etc. this kind of uh, stores. So now we are going to see an increase in Denmark for sure, but it's an, in, a, an controlled increase in the number of cases. So what we've seen at my hospital and other hospitals as well, we have seen less referrals of spinal patients with metastases, for example, lesser traumas, lesser patients with strokes, etc. just like uh, I think Ian said the same in uh, the UK. Uh, and this is actually interesting because you should think that at least oncology patients should be the same because they're still getting sick, but they don't dare to contact their GP and they don't come to the hospital. So we are going to see a increased number of these patients later and maybe even worse uh, than they were at this time. So in my unit, my own unit, we have uh, canceled all elective surgery. Uh, we still do some pediatric uh, surgeries on growing spine, for example. And uh, all our patients has been canceled and, and changed to telephone conf with the patient whenever possible. Some patient has been able to come to the hospital to have an x-ray. And then we look at the x-ray and we call the patient. Uh, but no, no new patients has been seen, and the acute, the activity of acute spinal surgery is the same. We do the same as we have done always. So we operate all fractures we used to operate, and all meds and tumors infections. We don't um, make any uh, differences whether they have a neurological um, uh, impairment or not. If we have indication for surgery, we do it no matter COVID or not. One problem at my hospital has been, it has been chosen to be the capital region of COVID intensive care unit. So they made a special uh, intensive care unit also for just patients admitted to the hospital. And this has drawn staff from all other specialties, doctors and nurses, etc. So that has been uh, difficult to, to cope with, but it, work, it, it has been working. So what now we see our waiting list has increased just as an example, if I have a uh, spinal deformity in my outpatient clinic today, I'll not be able to operate him or her until March 6th. 
in 2021. So that's 11 months waiting list now. And it's really, really not uh, good. It's a big problem. And as Ian also said, we believe some of these patients will be more complex surgeries. And we also believe some of the patients on the waiting list will be subacute patients due to increased impairment of their function. Then, of course, as I said before, we have a rebound of lagging referrals. So all the meds we didn't see, they'll probably come in a big wave after this uh, when we start to be more open in the country. Outpatients, we are beginning to see outpatients this week. Only on, I think we're on one third of our normal capacity. Uh, so it's going the right way now. And all the staff in the capital region are being offered tests for the antibodies in your blood. So you get a quick test showing IgM and IgG. This is actually my own test. I had the COVID, I recovered, and I am IgG positive now for antibodies for COVID. Besides that, they took a normal blood sample to do the, the, the right or the true test on the blood sample, but it will not be ready until one month from now, approximately. So big impact on today's activity, but also big impact on the impact on the future activity, I, I would say. So that's about it. Thank you. Excellent, Martin. Thank you. I'll just take my screen off again. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, let, me, let me ask you one question. You said you were doing pretty much business as usual concerning meds and fractures and, and uh, infections. But you also said that you had a much lower uh, number of referrals. So uh, compared to the normal uh, surgical week, are you operating pretty much the same as before or you're operating less on this, on this particular patients? We operate less, but we still have them. So I cannot say it's, it's probably 10 to 20% lesser when we talk metastasis to the spine which is one of our big uh, acute uh, surgeries. Fractures, I do not know where uh, they come, but I have no uh, numbers on them. I think meds are the most significantly decreased uh, uh, diagnostic entity in this period. It's um, Martin, so it's not just in uh, our speciality either. So no, the, no. the stroke doctors are, that you know, people are getting a headache and staying at home and not waking up the next morning. and. Um, you know, people are getting heart attacks and they're getting oh, it's a bit of indigestion. They just don't want to go to hospital. Yep. Um, I think the other thing about fractures is that trauma has massively dropped. So, um, you know, there's no cars on the roads. There's hardly anybody doing anything. There's nobody doing any leisure pursuits. And so um, do you have a feel, have you seen many spine fractures in the last three weeks, four weeks? I, I haven't seen one. Uh, we have them. Not many, but we still have them. I, I, I just haven't seen one. Guys, I have a question. Oh, so, I have a question so, for you sorry. both. Yeah, sorry. I have a question for you both. Um, there's a, uh, Dr. Alessio Maiello is asking about this. If you know about the sensibility and specificity of the uh, uh, serologic IgG and IgM test. Okay, I can tell you. So we do this. It's a research protocol in uh, the capital region. That's why we offer this uh, test for all who have patient contact. So the quick test, they don't know about the sensitivity and specificity so far. They think it's okay, but they're doing this and an ordinary blood sample for the antibody test to make sure the quick test is good enough, but we don't have the result until the end of this month. And the, this test, we're going to have it three times. So we have it now, then we have one in May, and then we have one in June. And this is kind of a mapping of how the disease spreads in the hospitals by the uh, in the staff so it's a very very good protocol and it's going to give very valid information both about the uh, the feasibility of the quick test but also about um, how does this pattern even develop develop in the, in the staff martin can i just say on on that and uh, you know i'm interested to hear what people think but um we've had quite a lot of the coverage recently that first of all that um, the test is not reliable, but more worrying than that is that even if you've got antibodies, that it doesn't matter. You can then catch this thing again, which I think is a big concern about um, the long-term implications of this problem. We can only be out of it once we've got a vaccine. 
but this is exactly what we don't know at this point because yeah. we don't know about these just like the question that was asked we are not sure about the quick test but i have colleagues i have two colleagues they have been tested positive by swab test they never had any symptoms and now they had the antibody test as well and they are both uh, positive in the antibody test okay. they never had a symptom symptom they proved positive by the swab and then they proved positive by having antibodies so probably it's a good test but we don't know whether you can still be contagious uh -huh. or whether you can uh, get the covid again okay so um uh, dr lay has uh, yeah. if i've pronounced that correctly has asked a, a very sensible and good question which is saying, does anybody have any idea or thoughts if surgical morbidity increases during and because of the COVID-19 pandemic? And maybe I can just comment on that. I think as we adapt our surgical practice, we're, we're, um, we're doing things that we're not necessarily comfortable with. I mean, I mentioned uh, not using a burr. Um, have any of my colleagues got experience of feeling more uncomfortable in more protective gear or helmets or anything like that that makes things worse or patient delays or people forgetting about the important things in theatre in, in the operating room rather than, you know, people are concentrating on the wrong thing. They're not concentrating on a the patient. They're concentrating on COVID and all that goes around it. Um. I, I'm not sure that that's the angle of the, of the question, but um, for what I've seen, and I've, I've done a couple of emergency patients in my hospital, I don't think the surgical morbidity increases, uh, at least for the patients that we do operate, because there are so few of them, and there's so many of us, that everybody's taking care of them. And, and I don't see an increase in morbidity uh, I've done I've done a metastasis and I've done a couple of, of other things that came in, and uh, I don't see patients are doing fairly well as as well as they would do, or, or they were doing before uh, before the COVID. So I I don't see an increase in morbidity on on my standpoint. No, I agree, but it just but change in practice. Yeah, I can agree on that. We it's and uh, actually I'm old schooly and so I don't use burn all this stuff. I just use my chisel and my. I don't helmet. often, but sometimes. <laughs> By the way, uh, referring to the question about traumas, so now it's very very good weather in Denmark. So all these uh, 50, 60 years old, they're taking out their motorbikes, and we have accidents. So we had two motorbike accidents this uh, weekend, uh, one with uh, spinal trauma as well. So so. As long as you don't uh, are not allowed to go out, I think people want to go out and take a motorbike ride will be nice because you've been kind of uh, locked down. <clears throat> one more question before uh, I think we need to we need to move on. But we sure. one more question, Ian, concerning the burr. I have an interesting question here from uh, Dr. Yeah. Valestrino. I've just read it. Yeah. Is there is there any scientific evidence regarding not using a burr to prevent COVID infection? Okay, so. All I, I haven't questioned it, but I've been told that a surgical burr, which I only use occasionally, um, increases the, um, the, the count, if you like, in the COVID in the immediate environment by a factor of six, which is why it's just been advised against by, it's been advised against by spinal societies in, in the UK. Is, is it because of the smoke and, and or, or the particles in the air? I don't know. I don't know. I, the don't. I, don't know. Uh, I think it's particle, particle is the concern. Yeah. Okay. So, but then you have to, your patient has to be COVID plus for it to increase anything, right? Yeah, but the assumption is um, that we are treating everybody as if they were, as if they were, as if they were, okay. But in the operating room, as I think uh, one of the uh, participants has mentioned in one of his questions, we're not necessarily treating everybody once we're operating as if they've got full-on fulminant COVID infection. In other words, we're using normal precautions. Okay. So there's a bit of inconsistency there. And every day we get new guidelines from the government on what to wear. Um, it's not easy. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on with, uh, yeah. with the situation in France. That's great. Um, so, uh, 
sorry guys i i was just skipping at the at the at the end of the of the slides so um the situation in france as you know um we are in complete lockdown and confinement uh, for uh, four weeks now and the the french president um just uh, said uh, at the end of the week of last week that we were we're going to start a uh, progressive process of uh, deconfinement starting the uh, 11th of May. So until then, all the rules still apply and everybody has to be in lockdown. Uh, this means that um, uh, you're not allowed to go out unless to uh, go buy your groceries um, or go to the doctor or uh, go to work if you're not allowed or is, if it's not possible for you to work from home. Uh, the schools are closed until the 11th, and they will only resume progressive activity starting the 11th of May. And we still don't know uh, how they're going to do that. Probably the latest news we have is they probably alternate small groups one week. Uh, so all the children will not be in one room at the same time because classes here uh, for primary school are around 30 to 35 kids in one, one classroom. So since they don't want uh, that many kids in the room, they, they will probably split the classes in, in, in several and uh, have them in alternate sessions. Uh, that being said, I think the situation in France, uh, well, I will show you how it was this morning. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the number of hospitalized patients uh, so as you can see, we have 30,000, roughly 30,000 people hospitalized, and you will see all over the uh, uh, all over the maps that I will show you that most of the cases are gathered in the northern region, Paris, uh, the uh, east, so that's where Strasbourg and Mulhouse are, and some of them in Lyon, and there is kind of a limit or a clusters where the uh, infection has, hasn't been that bad. And this is in the all my region, which is here. Uh, and uh, the uh, region of Bordeaux and Brittany, they haven't been that bad. Uh, patients in ICU, it's interesting what you said, Martin, that you didn't have patients in ventilators, in ventilators and ICU. Um, because uh, we still have 5,700 patients in ICU, and that's ventilated patients uh, today. And as you can see, the same regions uh, apply for the bigger numbers. So Paris and the uh, East uh, Strasbourg uh, area and the north, the north of, of France, whereas in the lower part, uh, Southwest, Bordeaux and Brittany, the numbers are much lower. Uh, so, uh, let me, uh, okay, the uh, deaths in the hospital are pretty much the same as you can see. So we had, I've, I've chosen to give you the name of deaths inside the hospital because the total number that France is reporting right now is almost 20,000 deaths, but um, the uh, 8,000 that are missing here are deaths in caring homes and uh, nursing homes that we don't really know if they're related to COVID or not because we're not testing everyone. So that's a number that it's uh, still, well, they, they're reporting it, but I'm not sure it's COVID related, so that's why it, I decided not to give you this. These are the patients that are deaths related to COVID in the hospital, uh, 12,000 uh, this morning. And as you can see, most of the deaths again in the same, in the same areas and the same regions. Now, um, going to a smaller area. So this is my region, the region of Occitania. And to give you the population, this is 6 million people living here. Uh, we had 900 patients hospitalized and 262 patients still in the ICU uh, as of the end of last week. But 
we had 40% of the beds in the ICU available. And uh, I think this was the rate pretty much all over, that this hasn't changed. The um, availability of ICU beds in our region has always been good enough, and we never had a, a, the rush uh, of not having enough beds for the patients as it happened in the uh, Strasbourg uh, region. Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we've only had in our region 278 deaths uh, inside the hospital. And you can see the main cities are Toulouse, where I'm in, and Montpellier uh, and Perpignan, probably. Those are the three big cities of, of the region. Now, we're going smaller, even my hospital, uh, which is a private hospital owned by the Ramsey Group, uh, has a capacity of 425 uh, beds and places for patients. We currently have 144 patients, so it's a, a great underuse of the hospital facility. And we used to be 100% occupancy uh, before this, this epidemic happened, and we were turning on uh, what we call hot beds. So one patient was coming out, another patient was filling the place. Uh, that was uh, as it was before. Now we have uh, one third of the hospital that it's empty. Uh, before everything started, uh, the hospital was equipped with eight ICU ventilated beds. We more than doubled that capacity, uh, mainly taking out ventilators from the OR to install them and create new ICU beds. And this has never been used. So we have never had more than, uh, I think it was 10, the maximum number uh, of patients in ICU in my hospital. And some of the, those patients coming, and currently we have eight patients, two were coming from other regions because we are using the facilities that are not used, like for example, our hospital to um, ease the problem in other regions like Paris or the Great South. We have today a total of 21 COVID patients inside the hospital. So that's not a big number and has never been. Uh, so the hospital is almost empty. And um, uh, this is uh, worrying. Uh, and uh, the um, Association of Private Hospitals in France has said that uh, the uh, private hospitals were underused, although not allowed for uh, activity or, or normal activity, that were underused uh, and uh, they were raising the concern that uh, they had a facilities that could be used and were not, were not uh, taking advantage of that. Regarding the um, uh, guidelines, the French Spine Society gave us very clear guidelines of what we can and we cannot do. So the surgery allowed during this period is emergencies only. So that means radiculopathy with, de with deficit, either cervical or lumbar, herniated disc with a cauda equina, spinal hematoma, infection, fracture or tumor with neurology. This is what you can do as an emergency. Then the second part of the guideline is according to the local situation, you, can, you may be able to operate on radiculopathy with extreme pain if the patient needed, for example, hospital stay. But this is very well monitored by the regional health agency that will eventually um, come down on the hospital if they find out that they are doing activity or, or surgery that was not allowed to be done. So we, you, we need to be very careful about what kind of surgery we do because there is a risk of um, backdraft from the regional agency saying that uh, we operated or we carried on with our normal surgery procedures when it wasn't allowed. So the uh, regional health services have, for the first time, in, I think in, in French history, um, taken the authority of telling the private hospitals what they can and cannot do which sets a precedent that may be worrisome for some. Um, the other things that you may do is myelopathy with progressive neurological symptoms or unstable fractures or tumors that don't have neurology. Uh, of course, 
all the other uh, uh, surgeries are postponed without a date. So we cannot do any deformity, we cannot do any instrumentation breakout, breakage, and we cannot do any uh, degenerative pathology without deficit like lumbar stenosis, DDD, spondylolisthesis, etc. cetera. Uh, that being said, uh, we have not uh, had any patients. And, and as uh, you guys said before, Ian and, and Martin, uh, the other specialties in my hospital are also worried. I, I was talking to a, um, a general surgeon that, that was saying, where are all, where are all the appendicitis? I, I haven't seen appendicitis in, in like three weeks. Um, we have cases of people that are coming in uh, with severe heart conditions because they didn't want to uh, come to the hospital earlier. And, and we're starting to get a lot of uh, messages out on the radio from different uh, GPs and, and other practitioners saying, asking people to go on on clinic and, and to make the consultation to a physician if they have a problem without, without any fear that all these security measures will be taken so they, they, are, they stay disease-free and they don't get uh, uh, COVID or infected, but they still need to go out and, and make a consultation. I think it's an important message to uh, send out to the population that we are still open and that, that things that, uh, even if we cannot operate on everything, uh, I think that uh, the greatest problem will be the underdiagnosis of severe pathology because people are staying at home. Thanks, Sebastian. That's fantastic. Um, I, I agree with that last point in particular. Um, just uh, going back a little bit, and you mentioned on it, and both of you did, um, and Dr. Freitas did ask a question about um, whether you could operate on metastatic spinal cord compression in your hospital uh, in what he described as the golden hour, i.e. quickly. Um, maybe i answer that first. Um, uh, I'd say we can, but the, the problem is we're having is that the amount of administration that's involved, it can be obstructive. And so you sometimes can't get people into the operating room as quickly as you would have done. And because of resources being restricted, even though the hospital's quiet, we're having to have a meeting every day to decide who gets treatment so there's a brain tumor or a spine tumor or uh, you know or a bowel tumor it's um, it's extraordinary so um that, that is happening so if i can follow up on that so um, i happen to answer it privately <laughs> i'm sorry for that but so we have a totally different situation so we don't have to discuss whether to operate or not operate those patients we find indication for the like the patients you mentioned in the question in the q a so we don't have meetings where we discuss whether we should take this or that patient. We only do the acute surgery and we continue doing as we used to do before this. Of course, there's a little bit more uh, concern about whether it's, you know, uh, personal protection and that kind of stuff. But in general, acute surgery works like just before in my hospital. Uh, can, I, can, I ask you, can I ask you a question? Because this is something that is starting to um, uh, raise, it's a question that is raising here in France, is the availability of anesthetic drugs. Because uh, since, uh, well, you saw the numbers in France, we still have 5,000 uh, people that are uh, asleep 24-7. So there is, a, uh, there is starting to be I think uh, um, a lower availability of anesthetic drugs. And this is something that is uh, uh, starting to be a concern, especially for the post-confinement uh, problem, because we are not going to be able to operate as much as we want, mm -hmm. uh, be because maybe we will not have the drugs uh, to put people to sleep. And uh, is, that, is that a concern in the UK or, or in Denmark? Uh, it's definitely it's definitely a concern that's been raised, but um, the anesthetists I've spoken to say people have just got to use different drugs or different ways of anesthetizing. You know, gases more and so on. So um, it's a it's a concern, but it's not something that's actually affecting care at present. Um, uh, it's the same in Denmark. We had, we don't have any big issues with it now. It could be a concern, but our size. Country sizes like your region, Sebastian, and it's kind of the same 
measures. We only have 73 in uh, ventilators now. Okay, so um, Do Dr. Jethwa has just asked a question about prioritizing patients once elective practice is reinstated and wondering whether waiting lists will become issues with our governments as well. Well, I can answer that very quickly because waiting lists are very much an issue with government in our country in any case. And um, it's one of my big concerns. I, I, I have to say, I think I genuinely think, and I'm just going to say this, that things like adult deformity are going to be so far down the pecking order for treatment that it's going to be a long, long, long time before we start doing big adult deformity operations again, unless patients have got significant neurological compromise. I think adult deformity surgery for pain is something that I can't see doing for a year, two years, long time. It's a very That's, interesting you're, you're issue. About, with, uh, oh, sorry. You sorry, go ahead, sorry. Sebastian. Okay, so you're, you're speaking about the NHS or, or the private sector included? Uh, well, um, both, Sebastian, at the moment. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's difficult to justify morally sometimes. I mean, I work in both, so I'm different in that respect. So, um, and I try to keep the practice the same in both. Um, I know you're different in France, where you've got much more private surgeons than state surgeons, for example. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm when you're going to be snowed under, you're going to be snowed under with stenotics. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Uh, but uh, I don't. I mean, um, I, I think that uh, that will be the, there. Are, the waiting lists here are probably more in the in the public hospital uh, than in the private. And I think that uh, in the private sector, for every specialty, I think that all the surgeons that I'm talking that are working in my hospital are tracking their patients. And I think that each and every one of us is prioritizing his own patients and who he's going to treat first uh, yeah. once things open up. Okay, so, so time's moving on a little bit. So I'd, I'd just like to change tack a little bit and maybe ask the question of you both about um, the issues about training and um, education, which, you know, if we, we have trainee surgeons, we teach, we have colleagues who are more junior, we teach, we ourselves learn from senior colleagues. Um, we go to conferences, we have symposia, we learn techniques. What do you think the impact of this is going to be on that? And how is it going to change and how are we going to deal with it? Because it's vitally important for our future. Well, it's definitely going to depend on how long this issue will take. So if it's just a month, it's not a big issue, but it's going to continue, which it seems it does. It's going to be a big issue. I think it's a big issue in the clinic, especially, but of course also the meetings and networking and etc. So at the moment, we, at my unit, we are 11 spine surgeons. So we let the young surgeons stay at the hospital and then we stay at home during this uh, lockdown just to make sure the young surgeons got their surgeries because it's only fractious tumors infections. And then we stayed home as uh, the second wave. If they got sick, we could go in and take over. So far, it's only me who's caught the virus at my unit. But I was home anyhow, so it didn't matter for our activity. And the young surgeons are very happy about staying in front line doing the surgery we have now with the, with the trainees, of, of course, as well. Um, to, to answer your question, I think, I think it's uh, uh, important. I think it will have an impact on, on, uh, on especially on trainees. For example, I, I, had, I had two fellows that were scheduled to come um, and they had to cancel. Uh, one, one from Spain because the situation in, in his country didn't allow him to, to travel and because he could not get out of the hospital because he was needed there. And I think this is going to have a, a very big influence. If you're a trainee in 2020, I think your training will be uh, diminished by the whole situation. And maybe it will have to be extended uh, because you haven't had the proper training that you should have had. For example, if you're a spine fellow and all spine surgeries are off, then you're, you're wasting your time. So I think that maybe... Uh, all the, especially the, the uh, hospitals that are hosting residents and, and things like that, maybe they should talk about um, extending the programs so that the actual training is getting done. 
because during this period, nothing is getting done. So you're not getting any training. And this is one part. And the other part is that we are not getting, all the meetings are getting canceled. So scientifically speaking, other than this kind of, of webinar that we are doing, I think 2020 is going to be uh, pretty much a zero uh, for us all. Okay, so um, let's just think about, try and think about something more positive than about what is going to change out of this. And the thing for me, my big thing that I think is going to be positive is that patients are going to change. I think their expectation is going to change. They're, they're currently at home with, you know, and they're not bothering us and they're stoical and they're accepting of what is a very serious healthcare situation. Whereas beforehand, we had a very demanding healthcare population wanting instant treatment straight away, a society where everything had to be done quickly and immediately. Um, surely that's going to change afterwards and people are going to be a lot easier on us and a lot less demanding. I think that's a really positive thing that we can look forward to. Guys. I think that the uh, probably, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, for example, uh, and you know, the situation in France was very difficult in healthcare for several months uh, by the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020 uh, with the uh, manifestations and, and strikes even in the hospital uh, because the uh, uh, physicians, the nurses, everybody was saying that we need more means to treat the population that we didn't have enough money and the, the money that the uh, government allocated <clears throat> to healthcare was not enough. And I think that with all this happening and now they're calling us, uh, all of us globally like heroes and uh, people are applauding at, at 8 p.m. every day, the healthcare system and the physicians and the nurses that take care of, of the population. I'm hoping that the government will review the uh, uh, money that's, that is spent in healthcare and, and uh, maybe do some reforms that uh, need especially, for example, in, in, in nurses' salary and, and things like that, that um, uh, were probably uh, not, not good enough until now. And, 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 you know, it was taking before in 2019, you, you could see on the news the manifestations of, of nurses asking for a raise in their salary, and they were uh, hit by the police. And, and, uh, I think today that that has reversed and that the uh, global, uh, I think the people globally realize that how, how precious the healthcare service is uh, in times like this. So hopefully there will be a change there. Great. Great. I think we, we have to move on now. So for the participants, we have a, um, three questions. We have a poll and then we have two whiteboard uh, questions. Uh, I don't think we have any more Q and A's, so this seems to be a good time to start with that. So uh, we need to get the poll up now. Should come on your screen in a moment, and then please answer what you feel is right for you. So, Diana, can we move on now, or do we have how how many percent do we have now? I can't see anything here. We are at sixty-two percent now, Martin. Okay, just wait a little bit more. We could answer this question maybe that just popped up in the question and answers. Is it possible to use time in fellowship at lab in this COVID time? And how should it be done? Is it possible to move in a special activity? That's a good question. Uh, I don't, I, well, I'm, I'm guessing it, it all depends if you have a lab, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess that needs a, I mean, in, in our country now, that would need a government directive to allow that. Um, mm. Again, that's all going to happen. I think, I think the specialist societies in each country have got a role to play here as well. 
I think uh, we're having a meeting next week and I think we're going to write something to the government and lobby them. Okay, so we'll move to the whiteboard questions now. So this is the first question. And um, when do you think the situation will be back to normal in your hospital? And the second question is, do you foresee any OR capacities issues? We can all see this now, right? Yes, we can all see this. And uh, so the, the directive here, you need to go to annotate and then you can, for the audience, for the, the, the guys that are listening, you can use your options to annotate and then you will be able to write down uh, your answers here in the whiteboard. So that will be uh, recorded. And, and uh, it's uh, still anonymous. So nobody will know who's writing what. Um, so you got it, Anna? You find the annotate at the top of your screen on the view options pull down menu. Good. Yeah. I think, I, I don't know, do you, Ian, uh, Martin, do you guys uh, have any idea of the calendar of, of when this is going to be uh, back to normal? Because right now in France, we have no clue, absolutely no clue. All we know is that there, is, there will be a progressive deconfinement starting the 11th of May, and that's all we know. But we have no clue of when the activity and, and the surgeries will be allowed again. So we, we honestly don't know. Well, actually, so we, we have started to open last week and this week we increased the uh, opening. So in two weeks from now, we'll see how much impact this has done in the population. So for this kind of opening, it has been very, very uh, stressed that, of course, you have to keep your social distancing, uh, washing hands, etc. If you don't do that, <laughs> the algorithm will go uh, up and you'll get a lot more patients admitted with the virus. So you still have to behave very, very, um, you have to con be concerned on how you behave in society. And there's a lot of issues in that. So Denmark is very interesting because in Sweden, they did a totally different solution. They did not lock down the country. They believed or rely on the Swedish population to be capable of having common sense and keep social distancing, distancing, sorry. And they still have restaurants open, cafes open, etc. So Sweden has seen a high volume of uh, infected people, but they can still cope with it. And maybe Sweden made the right solution and not Denmark and Norway. We don't know yet, but uh, we are going to realize this in a couple of months, I guess. So maybe it's much better to get a lot more infected uh, or instead of flatten out the curve, keeping the depression of the economy and so on. We'll see that in the future. Uh, there's one more, is that another topic on the whiteboard? Yeah, well, there the, came one more question. What are the next webinars topics you would like key opinion leaders and Medtronic to organize. So please type in your um, suggestions. If you have any. Yeah. We're still 100 uh, participants, so. In the, in the meantime, uh, guys, there was a question that was asked. I, I answered it uh, in typing, but uh, I, can, I can read it out loud to you. Um, it says, in all your respective regions, we appear to have more COVID allocated beds than we apparently needed. Uh, do you feel that it is because we have overestimated the disease impact and panicked or reacted appropriately and managed the situation really well? Or, or perhaps a little bit of both? Well, what I'd answered is that in my case, probably both uh, because the infection worked like in clusters in France. So the situation was very bad in, in the East and the Paris region. And since 
the lockdown and the strict measures were taken uh, for the whole country, whereas in other regions like mine, uh, the impact of the disease was very low and still we're in full lockdown and not able to do anything and uh, with massive amount of beds that are still available and were never used. So I don't know where, where the... the uh, it, it's definitely the both, but you, we had no option. So the, the key thing is now, you, you had to shut everything down. You had yeah. to, or, you know, or, you know, whether you're doing Sweden, you have to do something. But the key thing now is how you adapt to what we see and how it evolves. So there's no point saying we're doing nothing for six months or we're doing nothing for a year. If things really change in the next week or two, we have to start gradually doing more and more. Yeah. It's, it's how we respond. Uh, that's the key thing. So we definitely did the right thing, but it's how we respond to what's going on. Uh, uh, for, for the viewers, please um, try to answer the question on the topics of the webinars you would like to uh, Medtronic to organize, if you could. Uh, so uh, they will taking those uh, suggestions into account for the next, uh, for the next webinars. Uh, and you have to, for that, you have to write down on the whiteboard. Um, so um, I think it's uh, time for us to, to wrap up. Um, I want to thank everyone from, uh, for being here. I think that uh, the, uh, it's, these are challenging times, but I think that everybody's facing things uh, as best as they can. What will be the situation when everything clears up, I think nobody knows. Hopefully it will be better. Uh, and things will progressively start to be normal again. Uh, how long will that take? I think that nobody, nobody really knows. Uh, but um, uh, I'm hoping everybody's uh, safe and uh, in good health. Take care of you, take care of your family. And um, We'll see you soon next time in another webinar if, if uh, uh, things go well with this. Thank you guys very much. Ian, I don't know if, uh, Martin, if you want to say something. I'm a first timer here, so uh, yes. I have no idea how it went. <laughs> okay, so I'm just saying, Martin, I, 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 before we all go, I just saying I'm very pleased that the hairdressers in Denmark are opening again. I need it, I know. <laughs> I know. Me and Sebastian don't have that problem. Yeah, we don't have the problem. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. Thank and you. Uh, see you next time.